This lecture is part of a series of lectures for a course entitled The Physics of Diagnostic Radiology. The second lecture, MRI Contrast and Spin Echoes, is broken down into four parts. Lecture one, part three, covers MRI signals and off-resonance. At the end of this module, you should reach the following learning objectives. To understand the origin of the free induction decay, to appreciate why echoes are more widely used than FIDs, to describe what a pulse sequence diagram is, to define an isochromat and its importance to MRI, to name several sources of off-resonance, to explain why intravoxel spin dephasing leads to MRI signal losses, and finally, to distinguish between type 1 and type 2 chemical shift artifacts. So we begin by discussing MRI signals, including uh, the most elementary uh, MR signal, which is called the free induction decay. What is the free induction decay? Well, to begin with, it's free, meaning the signal arises from free precession of the bulk magnetization about the B0 field, or the axis of the B0 field, typically after perturbation by, for example, an RF pulse. Induction refers to the fact that the signal is induced in a coil, and according to Faraday's law of induction, produces a voltage that can be recorded and used to understand the underlying system. And finally, the signal decays. It decreases in amplitude over time. And the characteristics of this signal are that its amplitude is maximum at time zero, that is, immediately after, for example, an RF pulse. And its decay rate depends on several things, including T2, or T2 star, and what we call a spectral distribution, uh, which we, by which we mean a distribution of frequencies of uh, nearby spins. They may not all resonate at precisely the same frequency. And this will be more meaningful in the context of echoes, which will be presented shortly. So we begin here by showing a very simple pulse sequence diagram. A pulse sequence diagram is just a timing diagram of a sequence of events in an NMR experiment. And in this case, the sequence is quite simple. We have a single 90 degree RF pulse. That 90 degree RF pulse will transform magnetization that's at equilibrium, pointing just along the z-axis, and generate maximum transverse magnetization, as it is a 90 degree pulse. In the simple pulse sequence diagram, uh, will generate transverse magnetization uh, immediately that will be processing at the Larmor frequency, uh, which depends, of course, on the externally applied B0 field, but that signal will decay. And as we mentioned before, it will decay as T2 star or T2, and will also depend on the underlying field in homogeneities. The signal is maximum immediately after the RF pulse, but decays relatively rapidly and in a typical NMR system with typical samples that we image uh, is gone within a couple hundred microseconds. Some of these T2 star losses, however, are reversible, as we'll recall from the previous lecture. So there's T2 losses, the spin-spin interactions, which we can't recover, but things that are due to external fields can in fact be reversed, and that gives us the ability to, get, to bring back part of this signal, uh, which appears to otherwise be decaying. And that, uh, we'll talk about in the context of echoes shortly. So the free induction decay, uh, although the most elementary and simple NMR signal, is not commonly used clinically. It can be used for what we call ultra-short echo time imaging of very short T2 species. So some tissues, uh, especially solid tissues, ligaments, tendons, meniscus, and so forth, uh, can actually have positive contrast, that is, signal intensities above the noise floor, uh, and using free induction decay imaging, it's possible to get positive contrast for tissues like bone and ligament, tendon, cartilage, meniscus, etc. Uh, the, the way in which this is actually obtained is a little bit more complicated uh, uh, than as exactly described. Uh, but the point here is that with ultra short echo time imaging, we can see in this case the patellar tendon appearing quite bright uh, and much more visible uh, than un in uh, imaging that uses uh, doesn't use these ultra short echo time. Uh, sequences. Uh, spin echoes and gradient echoes, something that we'll learn about shortly, are methods that extend the usability of the FID. So as we indicated previously, the FID uh, decays because of reversible and irreversible processes, and we'll talk about two ways in which we can undo the reversible processes uh, to recover what we call an echo signal. So what are echoes? Well, echoes are two-sided NMR signals. Uh, the FID, you'll recall, was a one-sided signal. It only decayed. Uh, 
uh, echo signals are two-sided in that they have a first half that comes from refocusing some form of some uh, NMR event, a gradient or an RF pulse that permits uh, reversing some of those reversible signal losses. And the second half comes from continued decay, similar in ways to the FID. Spin echoes in particular arise from the application of multiple RF pulses, and that's what makes the spin echo uh, distinct. Gradient echoes, on the other hand, arise from magnetic field gradient reversal. And this concept will be more apparent when we talk about gradient echoes in a couple lectures. This lecture will focus mostly on spin echoes. You can also think of an echo as being a line of case space. And case space is the raw data collected by the scanner. And with every echo that we sample, we're able to fill in one line of our case space data. Now there is a linear transformation, the Fourier transform, that allows us to transform our case space data into image data. And so you can think of one line of case space as mapping uh, to very particular parts of uh, the image, which we'll obtain later, something that we will, of course, discuss in a later lecture. So why do we need echoes? Well, the free induction decay is the NMR signal immediately after an RF pulse, and that signal decays very rapidly. It decays like T2 star, uh, so reversible and irreversible losses, plus something that we refer to as spectral, dis uh, spectral distribution, that is a distribution of Larmor frequencies within uh, say, the voxel that we care about. And imaging, in fact, requires certain delays. So while the FID signal decays quickly, we also need some delays so that we can play some additional gradients. These gradients won't uh, necessarily mean a lot until we talk about our imaging lectures, but the slice-selective rephasing, phase encoding, readout prephasing gradients, all, all of which are required to generate uh, higher quality images, take time, and during those time, the free induction decay is, is decaying uh, quite quickly. And in fact, these gradients that are applied uh, induce field inhomogeneities that contribute to even further spin dephasing. And so the signal is lost quite quickly. The concept of echoes, or one way to think about the concept of echoes, is that they let us buy some time. They let us reform a signal at a later time, just like an echo in audio signal processing comes back at a later time. Uh, these echoes also come back at a later time. So let's talk a little bit more about pulse sequences, and this will lead us to an understanding of the formation of echoes and image contrast. I said previously that pulse sequences are timing diagrams. It's a set of instructions that tells the MR instrumentation uh, when to play RF pulses and when to play gradients. And in the simplest form, we play uh, some RF pulses and possibly gradient pulses to manipulate the contrast of the underlying tissue. We saw this in the example uh, previously when we talked about T1 weighting and T2 weighting by changing echo times and inversion times. So we can manipulate the underlying image uh, contrast and subsequent to that manipulation, we wanna produce an image and we can produce an image at a slightly later time. And the pulse sequence diagram just describes the series of RF pulses and gradients needed to produce a specific MR image, the contrast that we want, as well as the kind of image that we want to acquire. And the contrast modules can include all kinds of things, including saturation pulses, uh, inversion pulses, and so-called T2 preparation pulses, just as examples. And the imaging module could use spin echoes or fast spin echoes, uh, gradient echoes or spoiled gradient echoes, and there's other ways of forming uh, image information as well. And we sometimes call this the host sequence. Now, while these are shown here as being uh, completely independent and distinct, uh, imaging, uh, MR imaging rather, can be more complicated than that, and the contrast and imaging modules may be closely intertwined. In uh, discussing MR signals, it's important to introduce the concept of off resonance, uh, and also the definition of what we call isochromats. Isochromats are groups of nuclear spins with the same resonant frequency. Ideally, all spins in a system have the same resonance frequency, uh, or at least the system can be controlled such that they would all have the same resonance frequencies. Uh, unfortunately, multiple isochromats, that is multiple populations of spins, all of uh, which have different frequencies, arise from several sources, including B0 inhomogeneity, that is uh, imperfections in the B0 field. It's not a perfect constant over space. Uh, MR scientists prefer to call this inhomogeneity rather than heterogeneity, so we're used to using this term. 
There's also so-called chemical shift effects, something we'll talk about shortly. Magnetic susceptibility differences uh, and gradients as well can all induce field distributions, which will lead to the formation of isochromats, that is, spins precessing with different frequencies, as everything is dependent on the externally applied B field, according to the Larmor equation. These are all various sources of off resonance that can lead to the formation of uh, multiple isochromats. So the concept of spin dephasing uh, is also important. And intravoxel spin dephases arises from off resonance, the things we just talked about, B0 and homogeneity, chemical shift, susceptibility differences, uh, and applied gradients. Uh, and intravoxel spin dephasing arises from off resonance, and this leads to a loss of what we call spin phase coherence. If spins are all uh, coordinated to uh, point in the same direction, they produce a maximum signal. And as they fall out of phase with one another, because they process at slightly different frequencies, we have a loss of so-called spin phase coherence. And we really care about this even happening uh, uh, within uh, the scale of a voxel, because the voxel, uh, the spins within a voxel contribute to the spin to the voxel's signal, and um, uh, as they accrue uh, uh, spin phase, uh, you'll get a, a net signal loss. And so this leads to a decreased uh, echo amplitude. We can minimize uh, off resonance uh, through field shimming, making our RF, uh, uh, sorry, making our B0 field as perfect as possible. And we'll talk about shimming concepts uh, in more detail in a, in a different course. And we can also use so-called refocusing pulses. And these are key to uh, so-called spin echo imaging, uh, which we'll talk about shortly. So here's uh, the concept uh, in diagram. On the left-hand side, we assume a, a homogeneous field, a perfectly uh, constant field uh, across the intravoxel, uh, across the voxel. Uh, so here we look at the components of the transverse magnetization, the X and Y components, and see that uh, we have a bunch of spins that occupy that voxel. Uh, and uh, as they uh, process uh, in the adjacent to nearby coil, we will see that we generate uh, a recordable signal, a voltage signal that processes or is a, uh, has the same frequency as the Larmor frequency. And these spins here are maintaining so-called spin coherence. We're not at this point demonstrating anything about relaxation as we did in the previous lecture. Now something slightly different happens on the right hand side. We have a series of spins, but in this case the field is inhomogeneous. All of the spins process at slightly different frequencies. That leads to spin dephasing and signal loss. So we can have signal losses like this even in the absence of any kind of relaxation. So there's no relaxation in this spin system, uh, but the spin dephasing leads to net observable uh, uh, signal loss. And this is the concept of so-called intravoxel spin dephasing. And so signal loss uh, occurs from this spin dephasing. And we don't like signal losses generally. Generally, we want nice and strong signals that dominate above the noise floor uh, for producing uh, higher quality images. Uh, so here um, we want to introduce the concept of chemical shift and chemical shift type 1 in particular. And it turns out, interestingly, that uh, the hydrogen nuclei in fat, because they have a slightly different chemical environment, process at a different frequency than water. So fat and water have different Larmor frequencies. And the frequency of fat is different by about 220 hertz at 1.5 T and about 440 hertz at 3 T. Uh, and we haven't gotten to this point yet in our understanding of MR with this course specifically, but it turns out that the spatial position is related to the spin frequency in MR, uh, linearly related. And so this means that fat is more spatially misregistered at, at 3T than it is at 1.5T. We use the frequency of spins to identify their location, and because of fat's chemical shift, uh, and because it precesses at a slightly different frequency, it's interpreted as appearing at a different position. So this is uh, sort of the chemist view of that. If we look at the distribution of frequencies in a sample containing water, uh, containing water and fat, we'll see that fat is downfield by about three and a, three, three and a half parts per million. And so uh, why does that occur? Well, there's a so-called chemical shielding coefficient, in this case for CH2 groups, which uh, is uh, 
where the hydrogens are largely found in fats, and the chemical shift shielding coefficient is about three and a half parts per million. And that means that the effective B field within fat is B0 times one minus delta. So there's a small, down, a small field shift inside of fat because of its uh, chemical environment. Now in this exaggerated image on the top here, we see uh, large muscle groups in the leg, uh, which would normally be uh, relatively uniformly surrounded by subcutaneous fat. Uh, depending on exactly how we design our uh, NMR experiment, we can actually, in this case, observe that fat is grossly misregistered with the underlying uh, tissue. And that's again because fat uh, has a different resonance frequency. Frequency is linearly related uh, uh, to spatial position. And in this case, uh, the fat occurring here is interpreted as coming from this specific position because it's precessing the sa at the same frequency as water at this position. And this fat over here is precessing as the same frequency of water uh, at this position, uh, although in this case, there's no water for the fat signal to overlap. So this is what we call chemical shift type one artifact. It's a spatial misregistration of fat because of the underlying chemical shift difference. There's another kind of chemical shift, which we call chemical shift type two. And typically pixels are frequently a mixture of fat and water. That is to say, uh, it could be a 50-50, uh, because our pixels are relatively coarse, it could be half water and half fat. And this causes a slightly different problem. The pixel intensity that we, uh, interpret or observe is the vector sum of the fat signal and the water signal. But fat and water are doing slightly different things. So imagine that this is a single pixel and it's uh, comprised of half fat and half water. And our transverse magnetization initially after an RF pulse tips the, um, the magnetization down. The fat and water spins may be pointing in the same direction and they begin to process, but as we've just been describing, they process at slightly different frequencies. Depending on how much time we wait, it may be uh, that we arrive at a situation where fat and water are pointing in the same direction. We can time the experiment, knowing the chemical shift frequency of fat, such that these things come back into alignment again. And if we add up a fat vector pointing, say, to the right, to a water vector pointing to the right, these things are referred to as occurring in phase and will uh, record a signal that's significantly greater than zero. Something interesting happens though if we wait for a slightly later time, and at this point, uh, fat and water are opposed phase, uh, meaning that water's pointing to the left, fat's pointing to uh, the right, and now these opposed phase spins actually cancel each other out, such that their coherent sum is something close to zero. And this is what we call chemical shift type two artifact wherein a pixel that contains both fat and water can actually have a very, very low signal, even though the signal coming from fat is relatively high and the signal coming from water is relatively high, their phases are opposed and cancel. And it turns out the echo time, something a parameter we haven't learned a lot about yet, the echo time controls the phase between fat and water. So we can control the timing of our experiment to have fat be in phase or have fat be opposed in phase. So here's two images uh, through the knee. These are uh, sagittal images. And what you'll notice in the in-phase image on the left is it tends to look a little smoother uh, in areas where there's a boundary between muscle. So these are muscles posterior to the knee. Uh, and this is subcutaneous fat uh, posterior to those muscles. And here the boundary between fat and water, water is relatively smooth because where fat and water pixel where a pixel is a mixture of fat and water, those signals are adding together, together just to give you a nominal grayscale value. On the right-hand side, you see something much more interesting. Uh, here, for example, we have muscle and fat, and a series of pixels lining up here. These pixels are a mixture of fat and water, but because they're opposed in phase, you get a signal cancellation, and these sort of, uh, uh, sort of what they call India ink artifacts, and you see these very distinct dark band artifacts uh, throughout the image in different regions where there's a boundary of fat and water. This can be a useful thing for distinguishing uh, boundaries between tissues, uh, or it can be a distracting thing. Uh, and in fact, there's some advanced methods that, uh, where we can use echo shifting to create a fat-only image or a water-only image, which can also be useful diagnostically. And so here we just point out some of the key artifacts that are visible or visible differences between uh, uh, in-phase imaging and opposed-phased imaging.
Uh, thank you, and that concludes this lecture.